Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here. Thank you for joining us for another Monday Market Update, 9 a.m. Eastern, every Monday morning. Get you ready for the week, stocks I'm watching, the economic news that could highlight the week, and what a week we've got. Talked last week about how the Fed is now expected to start cutting interest rates by the end of the year. That supporting stocks could eventually turn into the next bull market. Last week, we just saw a stock market indicator flash that has only triggered 14 times since 1950. Okay, 73 years. This thing has only triggered green 14 times triggered last week and every single one of those times in the past, the stock market was higher by an average of 23% over the next year. We'll also look at the stocks I'm watching this week as well as the economic news coming out. But if you wanna see the stocks I'm buying no matter what, my forever stocks for the next 30 years, click on the link I'll leave below. It's a free report I put together with The Motley Fool, some of my favorite investing ideas for the next 30 years. These are stocks benefiting from those trillion dollar themes like artificial intelligence, EV stocks, my best investment ideas for those long-term returns. Again, this is a totally free report. Just click through the link below. You're gonna get that report by email. The Motley Fool is gonna send you some information about their stock advisor program, but there is no obligation to buy anything. It's gonna help support the channel just getting that report. So I appreciate that. So as a favor, if you haven't done that yet, please just click through, get that free report and help support the channel. I do wanna to get to that rare stock market indicator though, because as we saw last week, based on that Fed pivot argument, that bear market in stocks is likely to end over the next few months, but I'm still a little worried about this short term and seeing as how bad the recession could be. And as we move into that first quarter earnings that are gonna be undeniably bad. Okay, against that caution though, last week we did see that rare bullish signal flash that has predicted those one year stock returns with 100% accuracy, 14 times since 1950. It's called the Zweig Breath, the Zweig, the Zweig Breath Thrust Indicator. Okay, and I'll promise you it is just as hard to compute as it is hard to say, but it has shown amazing accuracy, 14 times signaled since 1950. I'm gonna show you how it's calculated, not really what we're looking at here though, just what it means and what it means for stocks going forward. So let's talk about how this is calculated. And I don't wanna get caught up in the math too much because it is confusing how it is calculated. And again, it's only triggered 14 times in the last 73 years. So this isn't something you're gonna be following on a day by day or even a month by month or year by year basis. That what's important here is what it means, what it means for stocks going forward. So that's what I'm gonna concentrate on. But the ZBT, and I'm gonna call it that because I'm not gonna get caught up in all that mess that we had before. Is it's an investor sentiment indicator measuring the overall participation among investors and how quick they are to bounce back after a negative event. So think about it this way, you know, how, how positive are investors in investing in the stock market and how quickly does that cause them to bounce back from negative negative events that send the market lower. Okay, the indicator is calculated by taking the 10 day moving average of the breadth of the market. Now the breadth of the, is the calculated as the number of advancing stocks divided by the number of advancing and declining stocks. And to get this, you would need some kind of uh, data from maybe the Wall Street Journal, it's advancing and declining issues. Not Again, not really important here. The indicator is triggered when it falls below 40 and then rises above 60% within 10 days or less. And so what we see here is the indicator's record for forecasting those upswings of the market is very impressive. It has only triggered 14 times since 1950 and the S&P 500 has been higher a year later every single time. This is uh, data from Carson, from the Carson Group. The broad stock market index was up an average of 23% over the ne next year across all 14 of those instances. That's very rare to get any kind of a stock market indicator that has that kind of accuracy 100% over, uh, over the last 70 years. Stocks were also up all 14 instances in the following six months and only down three times in the following three month period. And of course, again, that negative event that forced those oversold signals was the bank crisis. Okay, the S&P 500 falling 4.8 percent in just five trading days, then rebounding 3.8 percent in the next five. So a very quick sell-off uh, followed by a very quick rebound is what's triggered this indicator. Stocks have gone on to bounce further, now up seven and a half percent since that March low. Uh, and the crisis just added fuel to that Fed pivot argument that no matter what happens to the economy, the Fed is ready to come to the rescue eventually, start lowering interest rates that's going to support the economy and support the stock market. So again, like we talked about last year, I don't want to get too positive on the market, we do see some great signals, some great indicators turning over that are looking positive for stocks, but it is, we are moving into that first quarter earnings season that is gonna be undeniably bad. We're gonna look at some of the data on that and how bad it could be 
uh, but we are looking at over the next 12 months, likely higher on stocks. So if you don't want to try to, uh, you know, manage your cash positions, those tactical moves like selling covered calls to hedge some of your risk, there is nothing wrong with just staying invested, folks, you know, investing in those portfolio stocks that you love best, those stocks already in your portfolio, adding to those each month and just having that confidence that, you know, since the 4,800 peak in January of last year, we are still down 15%. So you're still getting some fairly good uh, discount on that all-time peak. I do think over the next couple of months, you're going to get a little bit lower prices and a little bit better opportunities. But if you just don't want to have that stress of watching the market constantly, then don't worry about it. Then you can be confident that the market is going to rebound probably within the next 12 months, maybe even within the next six months. If you do want to uh, do some of those tactical positions, like we've been talking about though, at, you know, holding back maybe 10% of your portfolio in cash, maybe covering some of your stocks with those covered call options that we've talked about, that is a good way to uh, take advantage of some of the lower prices over the next month or two as those quarter, first quarter earnings disappoint and bring, uh, bring prices down lower. I want to talk about some of those stocks I'm watching this week, though, because we are heading into that first quarter earnings season. It's going to be undeniably bad. Again, here we see the S&P 500 earnings expectations here for, for the first quarter from the FactSet Earnings Insight uh, report comes out every Friday. Free report, great report for, uh, for investors there. And as you can see here, investors are now expecting the S&P 500, the stocks in the S&P 500, those 500 largest companies in the United States here to report earnings, profits, net income that is 6.5% lower than what what it was last the first quarter of last year. So we are seeing an earnings recession. We already had a negative earnings growth over the fourth quarter of last year. We're going to see it here in the first quarter, and we're actually expecting negative earnings growth in the second quarter of this year as well. Three quarters in a row, technically an earnings recession that could um, could end up hurting the stock market if companies come through with negative warnings about future outlook. Now, what I want to talk about specifically is tech stocks here. You're going to see here information technology, the sector here. All eyes are going to be on tech earnings over the next couple of weeks with all the reports of, of layoffs we've heard from tech companies, the recession already here in these company profits. Okay, earnings for tech companies in the S&P 500, you see here, expected down 15% from that same period last year. That is the third worst sector after healthcare, which is expected down 21%, and materials expected to report earnings that are down 36%, more than a third down from the same first quarter of last year. Now, if we take that information and we apply it to where the price to earnings ratios are on stocks in these sectors, you know, the price of uh, all the stocks in each sector divided by their expected earnings over the next year, stocks in that sector are still trading at fairly expensive. Okay. You see all the way over here on the left, the most expensive sector in the market technology right here, 24.5 times on a PE basis. Okay. That is well above the 19 times average over the last 10 years. What this tells me is that uh, there is a good chance investors sell tech shares at, in the face of those plunging earnings and really expensive valuations. Investors are also going to be watching Bed Bath & Beyond, ticker BBBY. It's going to report its earnings on Wednesday as the stock continues to hit all-time lows ahead of what might be an unavoidable bankruptcy. Management here has failed to several attempts to get that last-minute financing, and, and Wednesday could be the make-or-break moment. You know, still here, shares of several companies, uh, Hertz being the best example, have skyrocketed on their bankruptcy news over the past year. And it's possible with BBBY, uh, if you are going to gamble on that big bankruptcy news rally so that the uh, the stocks do take off after that is announced, make sure you take your profits quickly, folks, because these moves have always faded fast. I'm also going to be watching U.S. Bancorp, ticker USB, and a lot of the other regional banks reporting this week and next. Uh, USB is reporting its earnings this Wednesday could show its strength against a 30% sell-off in that banking crisis. You know, while this is a, a regional bank, you know, it is also the fifth largest bank in the U.S. by deposits and, and has that nationwide footprint. Okay, I think that gives it the scale and the financial strength that you're not going to see with a lot of these regional banks. I think like a lot of the big banks like JP, JP Morgan, U.S. Bank could, could actually surprise on the upside with its deposits and with its outlook. Also going to be watching Teva Pharmaceuticals, ticker TEVA. It's plunged almost 11% on Friday after its biologics application was denied by the FDA, an event that wasn't altogether unexpected given the company's history of biologics development and, and its partnership with, with that developer, as well as just several missed deadlines. Okay. Uh, the application, I think the application will eventually be approved. And, 
and shares here are trading for just 3.4 times 2023 expected earnings, a PE basis of 3.4 times. That is a discount of 85% to the pharma industry average PE ratio. Now, Teva Pharmaceuticals, it has had a rough five years. It got caught up in a um, you know a merger acquisition strategy where it just put on tens of billions of dollars of debt, basically buying every drug maker it could find uh, in that acquisition strategy. Couldn't uh, couldn't deliver on those deals, so it, it ballooned up to like thirty billion dollars in debt. It has since started paying off a lot of that. Got caught up in the opioid litigation. It has since settled that. The company has been successful in its turnaround plan, moving past the lawsuits, generating billions of dollars, a billion dollars in free cash flow over the last year while paying down that debt. Now I'm adding to my position on last week's drop and have a target price of twelve dollars a share over the next year. Again, the market is going to be solely focused on first quarter earnings this week. We can look again at these earnings growth expectations. Uh, most of the market expected to see negative earnings growth from consumer staples down 5%, utilities down 9%, con communication services and information technology stocks, both reporting 15% loss or decline in earnings over the last year, healthcare down 20%, materials down 35%. The only ones to see uh, positive earnings growth, consumer discretionary. Now this one is really interesting because we do know that the consumer is slowing down, but consumer discretionary supposed to to post a 34% earnings growth compared to the same quarter of last year. So that will be interesting watching uh, watching to see if some of these retail companies can turn around those and report that very high, uh, very high uh, earnings growth. What I would be worried about here is their outlook. And of course, this is always the fact with earnings, the market has a fairly good idea of what a company is going to report on its earnings. They're usually very close to what the company actually does end up reporting. But what surprises the market, what leads shares higher or lower is what management says about the coming quarters and about the rest of the year. This is where what worries me about consumer discretionary, what worries me about information technology. One, consumer discretionary, while it is expected to post that 34% earnings growth uh, from the first quarter of last year, I think they, uh, the management is going to take the chance to basically throw everything out, baby and the bathwater, to just warn negative for the rest of the year. Say they're seeing consumers get extremely, uh, extremely bearish on the economy, on jobs, and pulling back on their consumer spending. So I think uh, consumer discretionary companies, they're going to come out, they're going to lower their expectations for earnings for the past for the rest of the year. And that could hit the shares there. We can look again at those PE ratios to see which are the expensive stocks. And again, we see here that information technology still trading for 24 times on that PE basis. 24 times the price, 24 times what the expected earnings are over the next year. That is uh, compared to 19 times average over the last 10 years, so still very expensive. Consumer discretionary, again, 24.5 times PE ratio against a 22.5 times PE ratio 10 year average. So very expensive consumer discretionary in the face of that weakening consumer. So if we do get news from management of those consumer discretionary, those retail companies, then um, that, that the consumer is slowing down and they're warning on their profits uh, over the rest of the year, that's probably going to weigh on that valuation for those stocks. Looking over here on the other end, the far right part of the the far right part of the chart, we do see the financials trading for 13.1 times on a PE basis. That is just over the 13 times average over the last 10 years. So relatively inexpensive. Okay. You know, you're getting about an average deal there on the financials, communication services, those uh, telecom, those telecom, those internet and social media stocks trading for 16.8 times on a forward PE basis. That's against 15.7 times a uh, 10 year average. So a little bit more expensive than the long term average there, but still relatively cheap compared to some of these other sectors. If you haven't done so yet, please click that link below, get your free report from The Motley Fool and help support the channel. I appreciate it. Or click on the video to the right for the 11 stocks to buy that are too cheap to to pass up. No matter what the market does, these stocks are already trading at a huge discount and some great upside potential. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.